but it looks like we've got about a half hour before the public statement process and I'm happy to walk around the room and um, provide the microphone but uh, and just so every folks know we do have people in the room from Bluestone Wind that can also answer questions we have Alec Jarvis uh, we have Bill Whitlock Jill Van Dalen and Valeria Turan thank you I'd like to know where all this um, power is going to be utilized. Is it locally, or is it going to be all shipped away to other places, or, or don't you know? Or <laughs> so I can talk about power flows to the best of my ability. I'm not an electrical engineer, but so generally speaking, uh, Greg was talking about the collection of the electricity, right? So we're generating at different levels of electricity. We're transforming it up to a voltage that that is with that uh, matches the grid. So. What uh, Greg mentioned, the NYSEG Afton to Stylesville line, which is a, a 115 kV line. So there's load flows in different, electricity flows in different directions. It depends on our, uh, while we're producing and where the load and need is, if you will, right, for the, the electrons. So will they get utilized locally? That is possible. It's very hard to track the individual electrons. So if that local need is, you know, uh, it'll it'll transfer like the way it works today at your house, right? For it's on the high voltage line, it it goes to the distribution line or lower voltage down, you know, into your house. So we're a wholesale producer of electricity, of bulk power. So we're we're basically uh, producing onto the New York bulk power system, and then those the electrons flow where there's the where there's the need or demand. And NISO is the organization that sort of that that manages that whole. Um, you know, turning of the dials, of you, if you will, for the management of the bulk power system. Your collection lines, do they go in and under or across any gas lines? Because there are some gas pipelines out that way. And what do you do for that? So, yes, they do. And we try to minimize those, those crossings um, or... Um, yeah, and build, we all have access roads and collection lines that will go under the pipelines. So what we have to do and is work with the individual owners of those pipelines. right? They have an easement that we'll have to cross, so we'll ha need permission to, to uh, 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 horizontally drill or directional drill underneath them. Um, but then the specifics about the, the road crossings and those borings are will be housed in the crossing agreements that we have with the individuals. And the, you can imagine it might be different because there are there are um, there are three in the project area. So there's the Constitution pipeline, which isn't built, but the easement exists. There's the Millennium pipeline, which is Millennium and Trans Canada, and then there's Bluestone, which is DTE, um, which is a smaller smaller gauge pipe. But all of those will have agreements that'll specify, you know, to their regulation, their crossing. You know, their typical crossing regulations on how we do that. Is the map that you provided, is that the total scope of the job, or is there a future site that may or that, may not that, be added that, on? The maps that, are, that I presented today is, this, is the total scope of the application that, that's been filed with the DPS. No. The, there's a limitation with the with the availability of the 115 kV line that it has capacity and it's it's essentially preliminary studies show that it's currently maxed out at the 125, 124. Correct. All right. Uh, does Calpine have offshore wind farms as well? No? All right, so then you couldn't answer my second question is where is it cheaper to erect them? All right. Uh, who, who approached who? Did New York State approach Calpine for this wind farm idea, or did Calpine approach New York State with this idea? So I, I think the question probably is, is how, maybe I'll rephrase your question, is how did we get here, right? Uh, and, and really we you know, start, any wind developer, any, any project that's going to be proposed at some level, is going to take a look first at at the, the wind resource in New York, right? And then you're going to start to layer in pieces that really make up the, the recipe for a functional or, uh, you know, a, a wind farm, right? So the wind resource is, is pretty key. And then you'll look at the, the bulk power system I mentioned, uh, the capacity of the lines, 
is there you know looking at um, you know it, can you do is there enough capacity in that uh, 115 kV line for example uh, to, to build a to have a viable project um, you're going to measure the you're going to measure the wind you're also going to the first initial phase look at um, fatal flaw analysis to see if there's uh, environmental any environmental features to you know to be avoided you're going to paint a picture of a site that you uh, looks viable that's and every wind project goes through this the same the same analysis uh, and then you know if it if those boxes are checked then you start to talk to uh, local municipal officials which is what you know, we've done here start to talk to landowners uh, you know Calpine doesn't you know didn't own doesn't own any property in Sanford and Windsor and so you put all these pieces together and then start to move the project forward and to you know in, embark on all of these studies that ultimately you know end up in an application that's filed right so does that, does that help to answer your question sort of how how and why Windsor well somewhat but what I'm getting at is it's much more efficient to put these things off the coast because you have a constant breeze much more steady than we have up here 60 percent of the world's population lives along the coastline mm -hmm. hence my question is it more expensive to build them off uh, just offshore or to build up here and transport it to where the need is and I'm just wondering if we aren't just political pawns in all this because the governor wants it to be a green state and I'm all for that but he also passed a law in 2017 saying no windmills within 30 miles of Long Island shore which basically makes it off limits and I'm thinking okay I'm still for green energy but I'm gonna have five of these 650 foot towers, you know, well within a half mile of the coastline from my house. And I'm thinking, it, it just doesn't seem efficient to do that. But, you know, you guys are being subsidized by the governor and our taxes to build this wind farm. And, you know, that's the way business is done. But I just think it's a very inefficient way to use our tax dollar when you when someone could be building them offshore it, it just doesn't seem fair to the people that live here and are going to suffer the impact and as a relative of someone who signed a lease a year ago with your company none of these I mean you know your business is to go out and sell these you know as a viable alternative but I was here for the first meeting and I heard a ton of downside questions and None of that was ever brought up when the leases were being brought around. And it just seems it's very unfair to the local people here. Well, I appreciate your concerns. I mean, one of the goals here is to ha to get elicit feedback, right? Um, and that, and through our public outreach as well, is to get that information back so we can design a better project. I mean, if I look at the your question about offshore and onshore, right, if you look at the industries and the sort of maturity of both, onshore is much more mature, right? versus offshore, yeah. right? If you look at how many are actually installed, and um, you know, I can't speak to your the competitiveness. I mean, we'll know shortly once we get more data from and more wind farms being you know, being developed and uh, that go into operations offshore. But you know, this is a mature. The onshore industry is a mature industry. There's turbines in every, you know, almost every state, right? Um, but I, I do appreciate your concerns, um, and that, like I said, that's one of the reasons that we're you know we we want to hear that feedback. Try to go in order that I saw hands, but I apologize, folks. So I'm just going to hold this out. Whoever grabs it. Hi, I'm Broome County Legislator Bob Wessler, and I'm here because I wanted to find out some information. Now, one of the things I popped you through this has to do with the pilot agreement. Um, I'd like to know about the pilot agreement. Is it a 20 to 30 year pilot agreement? Uh, do the payments escalate over the tw over the that term up from zero or whatever your agreed amount to full taxes um, but then in thinking about the pilot agreement you don't own the properties you're leasing the properties so you're leasing space upon the property are the by virtue of having these on the land itself is that going to increase the property values of the properties um, or then there thereafter the taxing Ability of of the of the municipality for that property for for value, uh, and then would that negate your pilot agreement? Negate the um, um, the you know 
the, the increase type of a thing. So I don't understand exactly how an entity leasing is going to be paying an agreement because you don't own the property unless there's a, a, a type of that. Also, I don't, uh, if you would be kind to explain your, um, the amount of money being brought in from the state through your incentives, uh, actual numbers and not, gener you know, I, I mean not to the penny, but, you know, like that. But also then another big question for me is, was this RFP'd, was this RFQ'd, uh, who are your competitors? And why is it that you, this company, was chosen? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Forgive me if uh, I miss one of your questions because there are a fair amount of questions in there. But let's, let's start with the pilot agreement first. So those neg uh, negotiations continue. Uh, they involve the county, the two towns, and the school districts. Um, and we've been in discussions probably for close to a year now, probably, with each of those entities. And hopefully they will be wrapping up soon. Uh, but it will be a, a payment that escalate a fixed payment that escalates over time. Uh, and it, uh, I think we're centered around a 30 year agreement right now. Um, so I think that answers your first question. The second part of the question is what, so what that is, is an agreed upon assessed value of the, of the property, right? So, um, what it means is if the assessor goes out and does future assessments on it, 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 we've already agreed upon an assessed value. So that will be a fixed payment over time for each of the, the entities. Um, and, and the benefit of that, what, what it does for the, the project is it gives us budget certainty over time on what our operating costs will be in terms of that. It does the same thing for the school districts, does the same thing for the county, same thing for the towns, right? It gives them operate, or budget certainty uh, and it does escalate over time. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that the, the sum of those payments are going to end up in the high six-figure uh, range. So they are not insignificant payments that will be going to each of those entities. Um, now, did I, what were your other questions? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so the project has a 20-year <coughs> um, rec contract with NYSERDA. And so NYSERDA runs annual procurements that are uh, RFP'd. So we responded to an RFP. It's a two-step process. One, you have to hit a certain number of milestones to qualify your project. And then if you move to step two, you're allowed to bid on the renewal. So what NYSERDA does is, is, is pay for the renewable energy credits that the project generates. So uh, we bid into that with a fixed price for the renewable energy credits, and we were selected uh, as one of the winners. Uh, there's a number of competitors around the state. We're not privileged to who actually bid into each RFP, but there's companies like Invenergy, Oven Grid, uh, EDF Renewables, NextEra, a number of you know big uh, independent power producers. And uh, your last uh, was uh, money uh, that you're getting from New York State for this. Uh, what, 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 what kind of figures is that? Yeah. So unfortunately, our contract with NYSERDA has confidentiality associated with it. So, you know, I'm not allowed to disclose that to you. I would like to thank you for your presentation, but I have a few questions. And how many of the sites are completely locked in and how many aren't? I know of a couple that agreements for the area with the landowners and the properties around are not finalized. How many of them are not finalized? I talked with Alex a little bit about this, and this is one of my concerns. So I'd say we're about 95% complete, right? We're, um, you know, if you look at the application, you know, if we're you know, per per regulations, if we're to make any movements on the turbines themselves, 500 feet, we're, we'll have to you know, we'll have to make an amendment or some uh, future submission. How does but that how does that impact the studies that have been done? They all take that into account, right? Um, so if any of those shifts will change the you know change the uh, let's say the wetland impact, then that another submission will have to be you know will have to be submitted. Um, you know, but currently, this is our, you know, as we put in the application, this is you know, where we'd like to you know cite the project, right? 
this is not not unique to this project, but with any Article 10 project, if there's a substantive project shift greater than 500 feet or that results in the potential for an impact that wasn't assessed, that would have to be addressed in a supplemental filing. Correct. Why has Calpine set up Bluestone as a separate subsidiary corporation? So Bluestone LLC is a is a wholly owned subsidiary of Calpine. So it's, these projects are project financed. So. Uh, that'll be the entity. That's the entity with which has the the rec contract and award, um, but is wholly controlled by by Calpine. Because we'll ultimately project finance this individual project. Okay. So. What uh, the gentleman has just made the point that it's an LLC. So Calpine's not on the hook if the business goes bust. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. And I'll, I'll take a shot. I'd also like to know what the qualifications are for a pilot. So the first question is, so you're worried that we've set up a special entity, LLC, and if the project goes belly up, what's going to happen to the turbines? And under Article 10, before we have to do a, hire an independent third party to do a specific decommissioning study and then we end up posting a hundred and ten percent of the cost to decommission that project in the form of a letter of credit so if Bluestone Wind LLC goes belly up <coughs> if Calpine goes belly up those funds are there to decommission the project and pilot qualifications? not sure I follow you on pilot qualifications well, we, a pilot is good for all of the entities involved in the project. Uh, for Basically, for what I said earlier, it gives the project certainty on what our operating costs are going to be. It gives the towns, the school districts, and the county certainty on what income they're going to be receiving from the uh, project. Uh, absent that, and there hasn't been a wind farm built in New York without a pilot agreement, but absent that, where you end up is in a fight over the assessed value of the, you know, of the project itself. And that can go either way. That could, certainly the towns, all, you know, the county and the school districts are going to fight for the highest assessed value they can. We're going to fight for the lowest assessed value you can. And there's incidents throughout New York State uh, where projects have rolled off pilot and have, you know, been, you know, a fraction of what their assessed value was. So. Sounds like I ought to set up a pilot for myself then, because it seems like you're able to escape some taxes that none of us in this room otherwise would be able to escape. And if you're a profitable corporation, then you don't need it. But like any business that gets going on its own, we don't look for handouts to get it going. We're on our own. Why are you so special? Again, I think that's just a, a misconception of what a pilot agreement actually is. Uh, and, and it gets back to what the assessed value is going to be. Uh, it could end up being far less than the amount we're agreeing to with the towns. So you would, add, without a pilot, and, and it will fluctuate, fluctuate year to year, uh, you have no certainty what your future revenues are going to be. They could end up being a fraction of what was, is negotiated in the pilot. Um, so we certainly think all parties are better off uh, with a settled assessed value so everybody knows what it is. There's both upside and downside to it. Right, that's exactly right. And that, so under the old rules of a pilot, 
in New York, it was limited to, I think, a, a term of uh, 15 years in a lot of cases. And so there are wind farms in New York that have rolled off of pilot. And you're exactly right. They're going to go back and try to get the lowest assessed value that they can to keep that project operating. What we are in discussions for here is a 30-year pilot, which is equal to the useful life of the project, that escalates each year. So no, there will be no need to come back and negotiate them. Um, I had heard, I don't know if it was now or earlier, that these um, mills potentially have the power to supply 20,000 homes. If that's correct, or if I misread that previously. Um, but there's only 2,400 residents of Sanford, so certainly the power isn't destined for Sanford. And given that, um, where the power is actually going, which is New York City, um, because down there they've, they'll actually pay extra for wind power, but they've actually banned turbines down in that area. And so what they're doing is they're sending them up here, just like they do with their garbage dumps. And I know we've got some guys who are paid to be here, some laborers, but the uh, seven or whatever number of jobs they're going to have here long term, those aren't going to be laborer jobs. And they're not going to be people from Sanford or Windsor. They're going to be somebody, they could live within a 50-mile radius. These guys are out from Binghamton, and God bless them. But, you know, long-term wind turbines don't need laborers. And so you say this power goes into a general grid, but we're not going to use it. It's not for our benefit. Why do we want these turbines here? You know, I get a high six-figure number, potentially high six-figure number, that's going to go to schools in the both districts. But, you know, the property values, my property values, are going to go down. And, you know, our main industry up here is, whether we like it or not, downstate tourists. And they've already shown they don't like windmills. And they're not going to want to come up here and buy our property. This is going to impact us. I guess I, I'm trying to understand your studies that you've done um, for that quality of living, however that might look, whether it's noise or, or flicker or wh whatever you're discussing. Are you looking at studies that have windmills to the height that you're proposing for Sanford and Windsor? Are they the same size? Are they larger? Are they smaller? How do they compare with... Okay. <laughs> so with respect to studies that were completed to support the exhibits, um, many of the studies, specifically noise, visual, shadow flicker, were based on the, uh, on the turbines proposed for this particular project. They were all project specific. They weren't simply referencing another study. In certain parts of the application, there was more of a literature review, review provided. In, in certain parts of that literature review, they were, some of those studies were based on shorter turbines. But in this particular project, for noise, for instance, um, it was based on the sensitive receptors within this facility area and of the various turbines that are under consideration in the application, the loudest. So for visual, it was looking at the sensitive sites, visually sensitive resources in this facility area and of all the turbines that are being picked under consideration in this application, the tallest. So we looked at kind of the worst case situations uh, in each of these project specific studies. A little bit of shadow flicker, a little bit of sound. Over, over the 30 year period, it grew to the point where it could create health issues? Uh, it, it, there are certain, the shadow flicker, for instance, is uh, more of an, an, a long term annoyance um, kind of impact, particularly at the 30 hours per year threshold, which, as I indicated, we're looking to get that down so there'll be zero receptors. But to your point about cumulative impacts, potentially yes, in the way that we looked to assess that was by, in the receptor data that I alluded to earlier, it's the same receptor data for shadow flicker and it's the same receptor data for the noise study so that we can look at a particular receptor and say, well, this house has, uh, uh, to, 
we don't have it for this project because we'll get the flicker down to zero, but this house has flicker and it has noise so that we can look and make those assessments and we don't have that at this situation. But we were able to do the studies to show that information. What it could possibly create health issues over the 30-year uh, 30 span? Just cumulative? It, there are, impacts can be, can be reviewed cumulatively, but we, there's no, we, there's not as if, um, we, and we don't have that situation in this project, but I don't know, I'm not a, a health scientist to say what the cumulative effects would be of a little bit of this, a little bit of that over a 30 year term. Okay. Excuse me? Give us an idea how many decibels these things make. The, the, as indicated in the Exhibit 19 of. Yep. So that, I don't have that data with me, with, but with respect to the study, with respect to the standards and what we're trying to achieve from a community impact and a public health and safety impact, the 45 dBA at, uh, at, at, at full yeah. power? That it's modeled at full power. Yeah. It's based on the power outputs provided by the manufacturer. I mean, I don't know if that many people realize what like 70 or 80 decibels is. I don't know if they go to that eye during the day, but if they do, that's quite loud. No, the the goal. At, no sensitive sound receptor will exceed forty five. Houses. So the municipal planning representatives I alluded to was part of our outreach effort. So when we assess visual impacts, we try to look at it from a couple different perspectives. We're trying to look at it from sen visually sensitive resources, uh, state parks, various re recreational areas, areas where people gather. Um, but pri it's primarily uh, not, we're, we're not looking at each individual property owner. We're not looking at each individual business. If there's a school, if there's a university, those would be identified as a, as a significant visually sensitive receptor. But the purpose of soliciting the information from the municipal planning representatives was to get feedback about potentially visually sensitive receptors that we didn't account for in our initial study. And we, we got responses back from, I believe we got responses back from the village deposit. We got responses back, I believe, from the town of Sanford. So, it's, so from our perspective, we're trying to solicit information and in a, a way to cast a wide net is to send letters to municipal planning representatives, municipal historians, uh, town executives, so that if there's something going on, hey, by the way, you should be mindful of the elementary school is going to get built here, and we think we're going to have a park here, and we want to keep this as a sensitive receptor. Those were added into our list. So we solicited, we probably sent around 30 to 40 letters, including agencies like the Southern Tier Planning uh, Commission so that we can get kind of a variety of sides. Because if we send out private, we, for on the water well survey, we sent uh, I don't know, 400 letters to private residents re requesting information on water wells, and the response rate is not extremely high. So with respect to identifying visually sensitive sites that affect the community, a good way to get a wide net is to talk to like the municipal planning board and the municipal historian to try to get some of that information. But we were only able to operate off the information that we that we were able to get back. Can you give an example of what a 45 dBA sound is? In the in the exhibit, we actually have a table, and I don't have it with me. I can we follow, let's follow up, and it talks about various 45, 55, 65, 75. What and it, what type of uh, noise, com that noise that would be? Uh, we we can certainly follow up and look at that table. Shouting. Correct. It, what does a car sound like? What does an airplane taking off sound like? Those kinds of things. Um, I have a question towards the panel here. I just want a clarification. So once you're through all the hearings and you make a decision for or against, so say if you make a decision for this going through, once you've decided that and say the town comes back and says, well, maybe we don't really want these here. Does the town have any kind of a power once you've decided it's okay um, to stop it if we wanted to? Can I borrow the mic? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so let me just clarify 
who makes the decision first so so that's clear this the decision ultimately will be made by the siding board and the siding board consists of a the chairperson who is the chair of the New York State Public Service Commission, um, the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, the commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, uh, the commissioner of, or I'm sorry, the chair of NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, um, the New York State Economic Development Commissioner, and there will be, or there in theory, there can be two ad hoc members, meaning two local community members that also sit on the siding board and, and get a vote. I'm not sure if we've got two ad hoc members in this case or not. Uh, but it's the siding board that will make the decision. And uh, that decision would be potentially subject to review in court by means of an Article 78 proceeding, which is a special proceeding brought in the third department, third judicial department to challenge the legality of the siding board's decision. So what we do, the examiners, is we assemble the record and, and formulate recommendations for siding board action. And then once it goes to the siding board, the siding board decides based on its review of our recommendations and its review of the record as a whole, what action it wants to take. If the project is approved, it could be approved with certificate conditions. And what we've seen in, in the Casadega case, for example, is uh, that conditions are attached to the approval, setting limits on, on various potential impacts. Um, you know, setting a limit on noise impacts, setting a limit on uh, mitigation factors for uh, mitigating potential impacts on avian resources. Um, so there's a host of different things, theoretically, that the signing board could attach as conditions to a certificate in this or any Article, uh, or any, uh, article 10 case. Um, it remains to be seen what our recommendations will be, because we're still assembling the record. But it would be difficult for a town to say no if it gets approved. I, I, I hesitate to, to speak in those terms just because by training it's hard for me to speak in absolutes like that. I mean, you challenge the decision. I, I guess it'd be fair to say that you'd have to make a showing that, that the siding board's decision was unlawful. How that, what form that might take would remain to be seen. And it's really, I find it difficult to try and say it would be hard or easy. It's always fact intensive. It's a long process. Any judicial review would be long, yeah. But it would, it was, you know, the siding board decision would not necessarily be the end of the matter if somebody had a good faith claim that siding board decision was contrary to law. That's just like any governmental action, right? The town participating in the proceeding now. Is there, are there parties? The yes, yes. Yeah, the towns are parties to the action. Yeah, okay. I, I did have one question for, for the company. You talked about um, visual stakeholders. And uh, soliciting input from visual stakeholders in connection with the visual assessment. What are visual stakeholders, and how did you identify visual stakeholders? Visual stakeholders are identified in our in 1001.24 of the Article 10 regulations, and it calls it. It indicates outreach shall be solicited from municipal planning representatives, state agencies, so the DPS, SHPO, DEC. So we've interpreted that to be. Um, at any particular municipality within the visual study area. Uh, typically, we send it to the executor of that municipality, uh, the planning board, and a historian, if they're available, to make sure we cast a wide net. In addition, we've also looked at the county level, so that's an indicator if there's a county planning board or um, uh, the, the Southern Tier Regional Planning Development Board. Uh, we try to look at all levels of, of uh, municipal government. Yes, thank you. No? We'll, we'll start here. Are there other companies similar to this that are trying to make the same kind of project somewhere else in the state? And is that still open? And does that have any effect on this? There are other Article 10 applications um, have, that have been filed with the state siting board. And this is a, an isolated application specific to this project. Uh, we're going to take just one more question, and then we're going to start the public statement hearing. 
when you when you talk about cumulative impacts, there's enough wind projects in New York State that have gone through all of these issues, in, including things like the pilot agreements and renegotiated. Have you looked when you talk about cumulative impacts? Are we talking about all of New York State and part of Pennsylvania, which is close by? Or are you just talking about the eastern end of this and the western end of it? I think that varies uh, on topic with respect to, um, say, avian species. There's a set distance that was negotiated during the stipulations with the DEC as far as how far out we have to look. And it was in, in, fairly broad in terms of how far out it was looking at primarily New York State. There are some limitations, however, with that. There was some willingness to accept data from other states, uh, a lack of willingness to accept data from other states. So we have to be careful as to being able to compare an apples to apples situation. So it's a little bit more specific based on the, the potential impact being reviewed. Thank you. Uh, okay, so it's a five minutes after the hour, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and go on the record.